Hello, this is Alan Boris. This is the first of four lectures on the pre-contact era of Cook Inlet. Here we will be talking about the first people in Cook Inlet. Uh, then we will have a PowerPoint lecture on the marine Kachemak tradition, followed by one on the riverine Kachemak tradition, and finally one on the sedentary Denina of the Cook Inlet area. Before talking about the archaeology part of this of the narrative, I want to talk a bit about uh, Native American origin myths. Mythology here meaning not myth as in a false story, oh it's just a myth, but mythology in the sense of an absolutely true story as the people perceive it, usually in narrative form, often allegorical, but portraying deeply held beliefs uh, held by a culture. As you probably know, there is a bit of a disconnect between how archaeologists perceive the story of First Peoples and how Native Americans uh, uh, perceive the story. That disconnect is not one that should concern us in the sense that one is absolutely right and the other is absolutely wrong. It's more a way of understanding different perspectives from different points of view. Anthropology asks the question why are cultures the way they are as we said and Native Americans in this case Denina ask the question who are we and what are our values and values are often captured in origin stories. Native American stories, <coughs> myths, uh, tend to follow a pattern. Sky Father or and Earth Mother create fundamental forces in the form of animal people. Sky Father and Earth Mother in this sense may mean fundamental spirits. These primal forces in the form of animal people prepare the way for the coming of humans. So from the time of creation to the present the world consists of spirits, of animal people, sensate, willful, and humans. This pattern is seen among the Denina. In the Denina mythology, in Denina mythology, Sky Father is Gujun. Gujun is the father of the animals. Earth Mother is Ka'unkta Jalen, the mother of everything over and over. She presides over the place where the animals are reincarnated. The story in Kalifornsky's, Peter Kalifornsky's book on page 40 describes the place where the animals are reincarnated. I'll let you read the story, but I'll give you a brief summary. A young man uh, challenged the wisdom of the elders, as young men are wont to do. He didn't believe the stories about how the animals were treated, or to be treated. He was out hunting. Uh, voles, or mice, it's called mice in the story, were bothering him. So he took boiling water and poured on them and scalded them and killed them. This would be a practice that would be uh, uh, abhorrent to traditional Denina. You never killed anything for no reason. You never mistreated animals for for just for no reason. You never killed for it for for uh, for no reason. He began to have dreams. He began to it began to haunt him. He dreamt of the place where the animals were reincarnated. There was a beautiful woman. It was Kaunta Jalen, the mother of everything over and over and there were animals coming up from the human land to be reincarnated to literally put their clothes on these would be the animals that had been hunted or trapped for food or for furs and if they were treated correctly by the Denina through the ritual of burning bones in the fire or uh, or distributing the bones of water animals in the water 
it would send the spirit of the animal to the place where the animals are reincarnated and they would put their clothes back on and they would return to the human land as animals again. What this does, of course, is puts into allegorical mythology the fundamental practice of ecology. Treat the land well and the natural systems will replicate themselves. But he had not treated the animals well. And at a point in his dream, the beautiful woman turned to look at him, and she turned to an ugly person. And it would startle him, and he would wake up. And it haunted him. He finally decided the only thing he could do was to tell his story to the people. A kind of traditional therapy. So he told the story about what he had done and he told the people about his dream and he told the people how he was sorry for what he had done and how he now believed the stories of the elders as to how the animals should be treated. Story ends but he was not himself anymore. The mouse story on page 154 of Kalifornsky's book is another story that depicts the relationship between Gujun, Gunta Jalen, the animals, and people. And this story has to do, again, with proper attitudes toward the animals within the context of the powerful spirits, Gujun, the father of the animals, and Gunta Jalen. They are part of the Traili Denaye, the mountain people, the mountain spirits, powerful people, powerful forces that occupied the upland areas, the mountains. Sometimes they appear in the stories as uh, giants and sometimes as little people. Sometimes they can transform themselves, but they are part of the power of the original spirit forces. Story, other stories depict raven coming. Raven prepares the way for the coming of humans. Raven is creator. Raven initiates cultural practices. Raven uh, sets the stage and uh, is viewed in this, view, in this sense as a kind of creator. Note that other stories of Raven uh, portray Raven as a fool. And, in fact, some stories of Gujun. He is evil. He does evil things. It's uh, perplexing, it certainly was to me when I first read them, but it reflects the Denina principle that no one is all good or all bad. Peter Kalifornsky has said there is good and bad in all things. The idea was to live one's life in such a way as to enhance your shadow spirit, to enhance your soul for the good and suppress the bad. And so the stories, the mythology, reflect that dual aspect and the, portray the idea that one should enhance what is good, suppress what is bad. So the Denina world then consists of primal spirits, Gujun, Gunta Jalen, later in the course we'll talk about about 25 or so that I know of or we know of, then the animal people portrayed in from the time the animals could talk. Um, animals were believed to be sensate. Animals were believed to be willful. They could decide whether or not to be hunted, for example. Uh, animals were, were portrayed to have a kind of soul. Then uh, the humans coming is the coming of the campfire people and that's the coming of the Denina. And later there's another time period. It's described as historic time and the stories describe this as after the whites came. So this is some a small part of Denina origin stories, uh, uh, Denina origins. Um, it is not my place to say it is right or wrong. Uh, it is to try to understand from the standpoint of spirituality how Denina perceived the various entities of the world. I think it is true that traditional Denina 
uh, believed in the spirit forces. Many of them incorporated later into orthodoxy or other uh, religions. They, many still, uh, accept the idea that animals are willful, have a, uh, have a, are sensate, and these categories sort of describe the, the, the parts of the world as traditional Denina would see it. Archaeology looks at it a little differently, but maybe not all that different. This is a chronology of Denina territory, a prehistoric chronology, meaning a time before the written record. I know it goes up to 2000 AD, but that's more a factor of how I could do the, do the graph. Uh, so prehistory um, means in anthropology the time before a written record, written record beginning in the early 1800s. The uh, chart on the, on the left, uh, the, the column on the left is time, going back to 10,000 BC. The middle part is the chronology as it would exist in various parts of Denina territory. The inland area, meaning the area in the Lake Clark, Mulchatna River area. The Iliamna Lake area, Kachemak Bay, which has a different uh, uh, sequence of events by virtue of the fact that it is a marine environment. Uh, the outer inlet, meaning the bulk of the Kenai Peninsula and the, the fringe of the uh, uh, west side of Cook Inlet, Tyone, Custatan, and those villages. And then the upper inlet, the Susitna Basin, and each has their own sequence. Uh, in this particular um, lecture, we will talk about the period before the Kachemak traditions, about in here. Uh, we will talk primarily about the Paleo-Arctic tradition with just a little bit about the Ocean Bay and Northern Archaic traditions. Um, the column here the has climatic events. We'll see this again later. Uh, it has cold and warm periods. This is the Naptown glaciation, the last glaciation, which would have been a part of the North American late Wisconsin glaciation. This uh, would have, this should have, have crossed over, uh, have been included as cross hatching here. I had a problem with, with my with my program. That's my problem, not the program's problem. One day I'll get back to it and fix that. That's the end of glaciation. So by 8000 BC, uh, large-scale glaciation in Cook Inlet was, was um, diminished, let's say. Not over, because we of course still have the Harding Ice Field and the Sargent Ice Field. Then a long warm period, likely this period will be um, subdivided as people learn more about climate change. Cold, warm, cold, warm. Then some named periods. The med uh, early medieval advance, a cold period, and then the medieval warm period, which uh, is significant to us because you'll note that a lot of changes happened right at that uh, medieval warm period. As we might um, say the warm period we're in now will probably precipitate a lot of changes. There was a little ice age event and a, a glacial advance and now of course we're into a warm period. I just didn't have room on the chart to portray the anthropogenic caused warming uh, from the um, Industrial Revolution on, uh, but we're clearly in a, in a warming period now. We'll talk about vegetation in a little bit, uh, but this describes in general terms the tundra type vegetation, spruce birch, alder forest, and then the same spruce birch forest with the addition of hemlock. So really from 7000 BC or so, we've had a very similar vegetation, uh, dominant vegetation as we have today. Um, been variations in climate, but not enough to cause major um, vegetation changes. Cook Inlet and Alaskan origins need to be understood within the broader context of the indigenous origins in North America. Uh, 
currently there are four theories or hypotheses is a more appropriate term that uh, speak to the origins of indigenous people in North America. The traditional one is the Bering Land Bridge uh, a corridor migration from Siberia into what we call the lower 48. Another one that is g gaining a lot of credence is a coastal route uh, where actually there were refugia or little sort of peninsulas of unglaciated areas as the wa uh, ice calved off which would have permitted people to move along the coast into again the lower 48. A theory uh, that has been promoted uh, is one that origins of North American uh, natives of North America came from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Spain and Portugal moved along an ice margin and moved into uh, the lower 48 in that way. And that uh, theory um, is predicated on the basis that the large uh, points, arrow points, spear points, not arrow points, spear points of uh, places like the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter and others have more similarity to those of the Salutrian points of the Upper Paleolithic of Europe and there are no precursors to those style of points in Siberia. Another theory, the fourth, is that uh, based on the site of Monte Verde uh, that there may have been occupation of South America by uh, people coming from South Pacific origins. Uh, of these theories, the first two are still the best um, uh, and uh, all in, implicate Alaska and implicate a migration through this part of the world. The uh, Genetic evidence does not support the um, European origin or the South Pacific origin. The mitochondrial DNA evidence uh, so far tends to support an Asian origin with peoples moving across either the Bering Land Bridge or via coastal route or some method into North America and then eventually into South America. This uh, type of research is, um, uh, is under a dramatic increase. Uh, we're learning more and more about it all the time. But so far, it all points to uh, Asiatic origins, uh, Siberian origins for the peopling of, of, of North America. A number of years ago, a hypothesis was proposed of a three-wave hypothesis. And as the previous slide showed, there probably were many waves, maybe more than three. Uh, that initial hypothesis looked at uh, the lower 48 natives coming in one wave, Athabascans coming in a second wave, and Eskimo and Aleut, the Inuit, uh, Inupiat, Yupik, uh, Lutig peoples coming in another wave and down here. Uh, this is probably still generally true, uh, although the what's called here the Amerindian um, wave is probably much more complex than that. Uh, it is probably so that uh, there was a wave that resulted in Athabascans, Dene, and another wave that resulted in the Inuit, uh, Inupiaq, uh, Yupik, uh, Eskimo-speaking peoples. This is what the world would have looked like uh, and during the late Pleistocene when these movements began. This is Alaska right here. This is the Brooks Range, this little glaciated area here. Fairbanks would be about in this area and Cook Inlet is about in this area here. This is California down here and this is uh, Siberia. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, because so much water was tied up in ice, this is the Laurentide Ice Sheet, this is the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, 
sea level dropped and that exposed continental margins and the Bering Sea area is uh, now, uh, it was, uh, would have been exposed during this time period because of the dropping of sea level and that would may have made effectively Alaska part of Siberia one continent and if you had to, if you went from one to the other you wouldn't know you were going from North America, uh, uh, from Asia into North America. It was wide, a thousand miles or so wide and probably involved uh, peoples hunting, expanding into untapped territories and moving into uh, this area. The controversial part is this corridor right here, when it was open, when it was closed, because this shut off at certain times as ice expanded and as ice retreated it backed up again. So it's a matter of figuring out when people could have got across here and then still got down through this corridor. Uh, the windows of time were relatively narrow. Uh, uh, this does not show the refugium, the little peninsulas where uh, that were unglaciated that we now know about, and uh, that's increasingly looked at as a viable way of movements into North America. But they all come by way of Alaska. This is a uh, 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 map off the internet showing the distribution of ice in South Central Alaska um, at the height of the Pleistocene. Even at the height there were these little pockets that were unglaciated. And this shows the uh, art, an artist's rendition of what the Bering Land Bridge area, Beringia, would have looked like about that time period. Mammoths other megafauna, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and this kind of taiga scrub tundra like uh, setting. The earliest well-dated sites, there are some very early sites, all seem to have some questions, but the earliest well-dated sites are referred to as Paleo-Indian, and they include points that look like this. This is, these are Clovis points, and these are I'm just, I'm Folsom, maybe. I can't remember what that is. They all have this flute or chip taken out that make them very distinctive. Um, we, there is some evidence for these in Alaska, but they appear to post-date those that appear in the lower 48, so there was kind of a reverse migration north. We have so far found none in Cook Inlet. And it's also, as I pointed out, there are no precursors to these in Siberia. As a consequence, um, there's, uh, it, it, people have looked for the origins of these elsewhere. But as I said, the genetic evidence indicates Siberian origins. So it's a complex story um, as far as these Paleo-Indian points are concerned. Less complex is the Paleo-Arctic tradition. Um, this is pretty well known from 8000 BC to about 4000 BC. It's known from the Russian Far East, much of Alaska, and coastal Canada. And this is probably that second wave uh, or Athabascan migration from Asia into North America. Later when we talk about language we will identify a language called Ket, which is an isolate in the Yenisei River area of Siberia that has a grammatical structure very similar to the Dene or Athabascan languages. And putting all of this together, it looks like this is part of that migration that resulted in Athabascan peoples in Alaska, and of course the Denina being part of that. The key artifact of the Paleoarctic tradition is a microblade and the core from which it is struck, very distinctive, small and sharp, inset into bone or wood in some way to make this knife or fleshing type tool. Um, and when you find these it's, it's, it's almost sure you're dealing with the Paleoarctic tradition, although they did carry over um, into the Arctic small tool tradition as well for, uh, for at least a time period. These are microblades from the Dayuktai culture of Siberia. Um, these are the microblades here, these are the cores, these are other artifacts from that same period. It dates there at 15,000 BC, they date at 8,000 BC and later in Alaska. 
Therefore, this is taken to be evidence from the time slope of movement from um, west to east, from Siberia to Alaska, not the other way around. Here's the Diuktai site here on the Lena, Lena River in Siberia. There's also uh, on the Ushki culture, similar uh, on the Kamchatka Peninsula. So the movement almost certainly was from this direction to this direction. This not showing the Bering Land Bridge. It may have been flooded at that time. No big trick getting across this, however. You can see it from Alaska. These are microblades and a core that were found in the Cooper Landing area of the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, courtesy of Doug Rieger, Doug Rieger took this slide. So these are certainly part of the Paleoarctic tradition and evidence that the Paleoarctic peoples had uh, occupied the Kenai Peninsula. We don't have charcoal or organic material that is associated with these artifacts to date it well but by implication they are as old as 8000 BC. So early on people were sitting on a knoll, in this case overlooking the Kenai River, making artifacts, looking for game, looking out on an environment very similar to ours today. This also also is a slide courtesy of Douglas Rieger. Uh, this is from the Beluga Point site and these are microblades that were found at that particular site, it's on Turnigan Arm, about, what is it, about 20 miles south of Anchorage, something like that. There's a pull-off there, and you can read the signs and look at the, at the site uh, location. We find in Alaska and many places other uh, alpine sites. They're easier to find because there's not as much vegetation uh, of, of artifacts that could be of various ages. Um, possibly early, but maybe later, we don't know. Uh, here's an example of one. This is over in the Jackrabbit Hills area. This is the Coquitlee River and the Swan River. And uh, over on the other side is the Mulchatna drainage. And there's this gap here um, that where there are artifacts that look like this. They're not distinctive. This particular one is called a graver. It would have had a sharp point. It could have been used to score animal bones to break them open, maybe used for um, um, uh, in the butchering process. We know they were used because when you take this high magnification photo of it, the rounding on the very sharp edge uh, indicates use. If it were a freshly made uh, artifact, this would break down. Uh, this would not have break been rounded like this. It would have been very, very sharp. Here's a photo of the setting. We found this about 11 o'clock at night in uh, in uh, July, so it was still light enough, but it was getting getting dark. Here's where the artifacts were found. This is the Swan River area out here, and even today, caribou migrate up and through this pass, going over into the Mulchatna area, and undoubtedly did so in the distant past as well. The people sat waiting for them and hunted animals, butchered them at this particular site. The, um, the vegetation history of Cook Inlet is depicted here. These are from pollen uh, samples or pollen cores. Uh, palynologists, people who study this sort of thing, would take a core of a bog or a swampy area with a tube suck it out so it all stays in relative order to one another and analyze the pollen grains, silica-based grains that are very durable and very uh, specific to species. So they'd count the spruce and count the hemlock, count the birch and so on and going back in time they can figure out what the vegetation was like. So there was a, a to 10,000 or so BC or pardon me years ago tundra a transition to the forest we know today so the spruce birch these are dwarf birch down here so this is the big birch alder uh, that's the forest we know today and it has been around for a long time other uh, uh, 
uh, fossils uh, indicate the environment. This is a mammoth tooth. We hadn't found mammoth teeth on the peninsula. Dick Reeker and Janet Klein have been working on this. This was found by a set, set net fisherman uh, at the base of this bluff here in Cook Inlet. Uh, one of, I think, about four or five now that have been found. This particular one dates to about 35,000 BP years ago. Before present is what the BP means. And uh, that indicates there must have been enough uh, uh, land area among the glaciers for the mammoths to survive and eat and it means potentially there could have been humans around at that time uh, but we haven't found evidence of them yet we can always keep our uh, keep ourselves open to even earlier migrations this then is uh, the later time uh, these are the cultures this is a, a review of that earlier map but a color version this is the environmental events and this is the vegetation. So uh, we've talked about the Paleoarctic tradition. These are the microblade makers. Uh, and I think we'll talk about the Ocean Bay tradition here in a moment. And then we just have little bits and pieces here that we haven't filled in all of this. Uh, archaeologists have a lot of work to do here on the Kenai Peninsula. From that time period, however, uh, the adaptations cultural adaptations break down into two parts. First there are the marine adaptations, the fjorded coastline of the outer inlet and further south here on the other side and up into Prince William Sound. Drowned river valleys from the land dipping and the water rising uh, creating these fjord-like situations uh, which are optimal for sea mammals. Seals, porpoise, whales, go in, feed in these bays and inlets where the food is concentrated and naturally if you are a hunter living off the land that's where you're going to be. And a marine adaptation occurs in this area. Terrestrial and salmon based adaptations uh, uh, are in this area. Not that there aren't a few salmon here but we don't have the major salmon streams like the Kasilov, the Kenai, the Susitna, the Chuitna that uh, occur in this upper part of Cook Inlet where we have this straight coastline. You can um, certainly hunt seals here or whales but they aren't forced into narrow confines, inlets, bays, fjords, so you have to work harder. And we apply the concept of an optimal foraging hypothesis meaning you need to essentially minimize the calories you burn to maximize the calories you get. And so uh, if you do burn more than you get, you're out of luck. You're, you're, you're on the demise and you'll die out. So this is an area of land hunting, caribou, and later salmon fishing. This is an area for sea mammal uh, hunting and the cultural adaptations split because of the geology of the land. These are radiocarbon dates for the Kenai Peninsula as of 1996. Uh, when we talk about the other cultures, I'll spend more time with radiocarbon dates. They're well dated. Uh, well dated cultures are the Riverine Kachemak, Marine Kachemak, and the Denina. Uh, we don't have as many good, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have as many good points, uh, good dates for these other cultures. Again, a lot more work to do by archaeologists. The Ocean Bay tradition, that is one of those first maritime traditions, although it does have, a, have an interior component in Iliamna Lake area, for example. This dates from 6500 BC to 3000 BC, primarily known from Kodiak Island. Uh, and South Coastal, cent uh, South Central Alaska. It is one of the first, uh, maybe the first maritime adaptation in Alaska and it's because of the invention of the harpoon. Now harpoons occur in the Upper Paleolithic and other places so it wasn't the first invention of a harpoon but it appears to be uh, an independent invention of the harpoon and it made coastal adaptation possible 
if you spear a seal, for example, it sinks. So the harpoon uh, goes in, it toggles, it doesn't come out, a bladder is attached to the other end, the sea mammal dives, pulling now a heavily weighted balloon essentially through the water, tiring out, coming up for air, where the hunters dispatch it. Um, a simple but remarkable invention that made a coastal adaptation possible and first seen in the Ocean Bay tradition. Here's an Ocean Bay tradition site in Kachemak Bay. Um, this is Dr. Bill Workman, a noted archaeologist who has worked in Cook Inlet um, for many years, now retired from the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, the site is in a sort of an intertidal zone now, but it's because it dropped, uh, um, the area has dropped because of seismic events and undoubtedly was high and dry when the people lived there. Uh, I should have included the other photo, but you can see this band of ash right back here, that white band of ash, which distinguishes a volcanic event, which is helpful in dating. So this is some of the, these are the, one of the key artifacts found here. This is a serrated slate point that was found there that is indicative of the Ocean Bay tradition as well. Uh, a few other sites. This is a northern archaic. Uh, we have a few side knots points. These are the key uh, points of the northern archaic. We know them from one site and from collections. Don't know enough about it. Hopefully with further archaeological work we'll find out more about the northern archaic pre presence on the Kenai Peninsula as well as the Arctic small tool tradition. This dates around 2500 BC. This site that from this point was found in Kachemak Bay. It's also known from private collections. It's associated in Alaska with the boreal forest hunters and fishers possibly with Athabascan speakers. That's still to be worked out, but we have more to learn about the Arctic small tool tradition. In subsequent lectures, that's it for this one, but in subsequent lectures we'll talk about the marine Kachemak tradition, the uh, riverine tradition, and the historic Denina. <laughs>